Uh, well, good morning, and can I welcome everyone to this, the 29th meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2023. Uh, the first item uh, for the committee's uh, consideration is uh, whether or not to take agenda item three in private. Are we all agreed? Yeah, we are agreed. Thank you very much. And our main uh, agenda item this morning is further consideration uh, by the committee of the uh, um, Auditor General for Scotland and Accounts Commis Commission report uh, on adult mental health. Uh, so can I welcome uh, everyone to the meeting this morning of the committee. It's a round table format uh, which is intended to promote uh, discussion uh, amongst participants, uh, not just questions from the committee and answers from those taking part. So I hope we can have a fairly uh, free-flowing um, discussion this morning to uh, elicit uh, the, uh, the evidence uh, that will be useful to us in informing uh, the recommendations and conclusions that we uh, may well draw. Um, can I say to those people who are joining us remotely, uh, you're very welcome. C can I say to you that um, if you want to come in at any point, if you put in the chat um, a request to speak, RTS, or, or indicate there that you want to come in, uh, we'll try and uh, bring you in. Um, and uh, to those who are in the committee room with us, if you um, just indicate to myself or to the clerks that you want to come in uh, and we'll do our best to bring you in. Um, and uh, to those in the room and those remotely, you don't, don't feel obliged that you need to answer every question. Um, we will, um, uh, you know, we will uh, bring people in who feel as though they want to uh, make a contribution to the uh, areas of questioning uh, that we've got. And can I also say to those people who are joining us uh, remotely that um, if you keep your camera and audio switched on at all times, uh, we'll uh, bring your audio on uh, when you're going to uh, uh, make a, a contribution. Um, could I start by um, uh, asking uh, those uh, witnesses who are joining us to introduce themselves uh, to us, uh, beginning with the people in the room, and I'll, I'll turn first of all to Chris Williams. Chris. Hi, uh, Chris Williams. I'm a general practitioner. Uh, my clinical work is in the Highlands, uh, and I am Deputy Chair of the Royal College of GPs Scotland. Thank you. Derek. Hi, good morning. I'm Derek Frew. I'm the Chief Superintendent within the Partnerships, Preventions and Community Wellbeing uh, Division in Police Scotland and responsibility for uh, oversight of mental health. Thanks. Steve. Uh, I'm Stephen Lowe. I'm the Policy Officer for Unison Scotland. Um, we're the largest union in the NHS and local government and... Uh, involved in a lot of other areas in the third sector and uh, housing and so on. Thank you. Can I turn to people who are joining us online, uh, beginning with uh, Mike, Mike Burns. Morning, folks. I'm Mike Burns. I'm the CEO of Penumbra. Thanks, Mike. Anne, do you want to introduce yourself? Good to see you. Yeah, I'm Anne Brown and I'm the founder of Chrissy's House in Russia, Lanarkshire, and Doug Heath. Thanks, Anne. Uh, Christiana. Hi, I'm Christina Mellon, and I'm the Chief Executive of the National Association of Link Workers. We are a professional membership body and a collective voice for link workers in the UK. Thank you. And uh, finally, uh, Pavan, to you. Hi, I'm Pavan Sredi. I'm a general adult consultant psychiatrist based in Glasgow, and I'm the vice chair for the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I'm going to ask um, uh, the uh, first question to get us going, and that is one of the uh, striking things that um, is evident in the report is just uh, the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on adult mental health, uh, but also the cost of living crisis uh, on the uh, overall state of, of mental health. And, and from uh, your perspective, we're particularly interested, in, interested to understand uh, what, what differences you've seen as a result of those factors, uh, as far as demand on the services that you provide uh, is concerned. Um, I'm gonna maybe start Chris, with you, if that's OK, if you want to kick us off. Um, so I, I would uh, look back to some, some, I guess, very difficult, very strange times when we saw a, a massive shift uh, in how uh, we were um, 
how, how we were interacting as a, as a society. And, and there was very clear um, messages coming from, from our government, coming from our health advice, around about um, how, how we needed to instantly and rapidly change how we interacted as individuals, as organisations, um, with, with fear about uh, an, an infection that was, that was a new infection uh, where we didn't have effective treatment or vaccines for, uh, uh, and where knowledge was, um, was being acquired very quickly, um, and ha and, but small amounts of information were needing to be extrapolated up into emergency me measures. Um, but I think, so right from the start of the, the, the pandemic, we saw messaging being uh, communicated out to um, uh, across society and, and, and some immediate changes for, um, uh, in terms of access to, to services that we would previously have always taken for, for, for granted. People in general practice, for example, um, but people were always used to being able to walk up to the reception desk and, or, or, or um, to be able to, to get a, a, to ask for an appointment um, for, for, you know, for things without being always questioned around what it was about. Um, um, uh, and for general practice, for mental health, that's particularly important in that uh, people don't always feel able to, um, to say to, to a member of reception staff or somebody who they're not yet comfortable with um, about uh, aspects, uh, especially aspects of mental health, um, especially if there's stigma involved. Um, of course, mental health and physical health um, don't have clear boundaries. Um, so I think from from the start of the pandemic, we, we have seen some something build uh, in, in, in terms of the a cumulative effect. And it's interesting when you um, hear academics who are versed in um, dealing with disasters about how, how the, the length of an aft aftermath, how long uh, an effect um, lasts. Um, and I think, so we've been seeing things building up in terms of people's ability to interact, in terms of their experiences using all of our uh, public services, um, as well as the, even their, their interactions with friends, relatives, uh, and other forms of support. Thanks. Um, and the cost of living crisis, is that, I mean, do you discern that's had any impact on people's um, mental health and the demands that are placed on the health service i i, I think if you're you're someone who uh, can rely on, on 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 knowing that money comes in and money goes out and that your your basic needs are met for i think um life is a lot more more comfortable i think being able to, to cope with everyday challenges um is straightforward i think when when that when the, the numbers in, in front of you are, are, are changing you have no control that must be massively um, um impactful for for a, a huge number of individuals and families thank you i'm going to ask um uh, pavan whether you've got a, a perspective on this uh from the uh the psychiatrist's uh, point of view. I was going to say from the psychiatrist chair, but I probably shouldn't say that. Pavel. Um, thank you. And I agree with a lot of what Dr. Williams has said. And we've seen quite a consistent increase in demand for mental health services over the past three years since the onset of the pandemic and subsequently the impact of the cost of living crisis. There's been a very specific increase for certain conditions, for example, for assessments for people with neurodivergent disorders, um, autism, ADHD, in some cases up to 700% to 1,000% increase in referrals. But what we've also seen is probably the greatest impact of the pandemic, the lockdowns, and the cost of living crisis being felt by people with pre-existing mental health conditions. And sometimes that's lost in figures around referral rates and demand. People with significant severe and enduring mental health problems were greatly affected by loss of social supports, loss of family networks, um, reduction in service provision over the period and the shift to remote working, which had a disproportionate effect on a lot of those people also spiraled out in terms of impact on access to medical services, having poor physical health um, in a, from a pre-morbid level, and the cost of living crisis has hit them particularly 
worse than most of the people. They're among the most vulnerable people in our society, people with long-term severe mental health conditions and who already struggle from a financial perspective. And the additional stress associated with the cost of living crisis has had a huge impact. What that translates to on the ground is an increased need for support for people with pre-existing mental health conditions or severe mental health disorders alongside an increase in use of services. So we've got at the highest rate of detention under the Mental Health Act as per the Mental Welfare Commission data at any point at all. I think that's a reflective uh, of the disproportionate effect that this has had. Thank, thank you, that's helpful. And we got evidence on that uh, last week, very distinctive evidence on that uh, final point last week. Um, I think, um, uh, Christina, you wanted to come in as well from the link workers' point of view. Yes, absolutely. So I think that what we are seeing is that our members are having to hold people for longer because the more all the uh, statutory services are stretched, the more, um, you know, they're being, um, you know, having to hold people. So the, some of the cases are becoming a bit more complex than you would expect them to take on in terms of mental health. And some people that were a bit resourceful and able to cope due to the pandemic, we're actually seeing people that were not sort of like the usual suspects um, actually coming forward and um, needing support as well. And we, we haven't quite managed to rebuild communities. So some of the community supports that were available to people before the pandemic, because of the pandemic, uh, particularly the elderly, they were asked to shield and those with long-term condition. Some of those groups have not managed to start again. So there is a need to rebuild communities. And what we're also then finding, if you look at the Maslow hierarchy of needs, people, most people are on survival mode because of the cost of living crisis. So before you can even build their resilience or helping them to cope with their situation, you need to deal with that basic level of feeling safe and having money uh, before you can move to anything about managing your resilience in terms of mental health. Th thank you very much indeed. Um, I I'm going to invite either Anne or Mike, I don't know whether either of you have got a perspective on this from uh, the point of view of kind of com community-based, charity-based uh, intervention. Uh, you know whether what what's happened to demand on your services. Uh, maybe begin with with Mike and then uh, go to Anne next. What, what's happened to the services that Penumbra uh, Mental Health provides uh, over the course of the last four years? Thank you, Richard. I mean, it's it's without a doubt that the accumulative effect of COVID and the cost of living crisis is having a major impact on people's mental health and well-being. We only have to look at the increased numbers of people that we ourselves as an organisation work with. I mean, a in considerable increase in the number of people that we engage with. I mean, last year, for instance, 12,649 people in, in mental health interventions. But again, if we look at the impact of suicide ideation or suicide itself, and how that impacts disproportionately on our most deprived areas across Scotland, and the impact of poverty on people's mental health, then, you know, if you put those things together, we, you know, the anecdotal evidence coming from people who walk through our doors is that, yes, it is having a big impact on their mental well-being. Thank you, Mike. Um, Anne, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, yeah. I agree with what everyone's saying. I think there's more, more than... Um, the financial impact, I think the social anxiety, the shame that people are feeling because of the financial um, impact and, and the, the difficulties that people are facing. I don't know what the answer is. We're doing. I think everyone's doing their best to find an answer. Uh, but we are seeing much, much more people, uh, many more people with very, very high levels of anxiety leading to depression as well, and suicidal ideation. It's the hopelessness that the, the pandemic has left. And when when, when Christina, I think it was, or, or Do no, Dr. Thurman, um brought up about the autism, on, the, on the, the isolation from the pandemic and the aftermath of the pandemic, 
and the access to GPs and everything else, people are feeling less and less valued and more and more worthless. I don't know if that's relevant to, to this, but that's how I'm feeling and that's what I'm seeing um, coming into Chris's house. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's passing the hot potato and people should be working together, but they're not. You know, on the holistic on the holistic side of things, I read that in the report. And, you know, the quicker we get this done and get into holistic therapies, and Richard, you've been in Chris's house, you know the way that we work. Yeah. People can walk in our doors, and that's imperative, and that gives people hope immediately. So I totally agree, but I know that there's more depth in why we're seeing the, the, the figures rising and the mental health. And it's not just, um, as Christina called them, usual suspects. People that have never been affected before are now affected by poor mental health, social anxiety, shame, desperation. And God help them, God love them. Everybody's doing their best. So that's that's all I want to say on it. Thank, thank you, Anne. And, uh... Yeah, we will bring you in during the course of this morning um, uh, for that um, kind of direct frontline experience. It's really valuable to us. Um, I've got to, now one very particular question I want to put, which I'm, I think I'm just going to I'm going to ask uh, Pavan and, and Chris maybe to respond. And if anyone else wants to chip in, uh, that's fine. But one of the things that uh, struck us in the report is that, this, that despite this huge increase in demand, the number of psychiatry appointments appears to have decreased. Um, I, I wonder whether you could shed any light uh, for us on the reasons for that. And I'll, I'll ask Pavan and Chris, if you want to come, if you don't want to come in, that's fine. But I'll, Pavan, can I, may I start with you on that question? Certainly. I, I think the simplest explanation is that's a reflection of the workforce crisis that we're facing. Um, we just do not have the staff that we need to provide the basic services we need, let alone the high quality services we want to provide. So the, uh, it's a finite number of consultations, appointments, amount of work that each individual clinician can undertake. And what we've got is a reduction in the number of psychiatrists over the last five years and even over the last 10 years, rather than an increase to match the increase in demand. And it's not just psychiatrists. Um, you know, mental health nursing vacancies are at the highest level they have ever been. And that spirals out across almost every component of the mental health system. So the, the reality is we just do not have enough staff and the re reduction in the total appointments simply reflects that contraction of the workforce, whereas actually what we need is an increase. And that has been one of our biggest concerns. So the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland has just published a state of the nation report highlighting the needs of the workforce, but also some of the challenges in proposing solutions across all the tiers of the psychiatry workforce, of the medical workforce that we represent. And the issues extend all the way from consultant psychiatrists, where we have vacancy rates in general adult psychiatry of almost 30%, which is three times the official figure of about 9%, which tends to be a uh, uh, underrepresentation because a lot of those posts are filled with locums who might not necessarily have the relevant qualifications. If you have a vacancy rate of 30%, you know, one in three posts is sitting empty, you can get a sense of how that translates into capacity within services. Thank you. That's 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 very helpful. And um, uh, workforce planning is yeah, workforce planning is something that uh, is a recurring theme that the committee ha has to address. Uh, Chris, I'm going to bring you in. Yeah. So I suppose I'm very keen to to illustrate some of the the changes um, in in how our services operate across um, uh, primary and secondary care. Uh, and so going into the pandemic, we we had a viable. Te techno technological solution in the form of near me video consulting uh, was was coming across NHS Scotland. It had been um, pro proven um, as a uh, as a concept that, that clinicians and patients alike could could use it. Now, as it turns out, it's not so well. Um, it's not so beneficial in some sectors, and I would say in terms of m mental health um, uh, conditions and. Services, I, th I think it's the face-to-face -face still has um, a pr predominant benefit. Um, from 
uh, and we, we see that as well in general practice. The, the, so in terms of number of con consultations, that, that's, that's one metric. Um, it doesn't fully reflect need. And, and in, uh, if you've got a s services that have, are limited in their capacity to deliver consultations uh, and you've got referrals still going in, you've still got need, then we see other forms of activity. So we see waiting lists increase. Uh, we see referrals being um, um, bounced back or, or rejected. And sometimes our... our, our psychiatry specialist services are, are, are under you know so, so much strain that the, the people being asked to, to triage these referrals to look at these referrals um, will sometimes you know f f you know find um, re reasons to try and hold hold the dam to, tr to, to, tr to try and knock things back to, to general practice and we see a lot of um, you know a, a lot of ref ref referrals that, that aren't being pro progressed and again, as a reflection of this, this limited uh, workforce capacity in the specialist service. In general practice, I would also just flag up, we've got, we, we're still counting our uh, general practice workforce in, num, in, um, in head count rather than whole time equivalent. So there's a, a real a, a hidden problem there. Yeah, this is something we've tried to uh, tease out of the Scottish Government when the, they've been uh, sitting in front of us, Chris, as well. Can I, I, I was going to bring this up later, but I'm going to bring it up now because it seems to me to be uh, 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 something uh, which relates to what you said, Chris. And that is one of the things that strikes us uh, that's contained in the report is Exhibit 3, which has, which has, has got a graph which uh, shows huge variation uh, from health board to health board uh, in uh, the number of face-to-face -face appointments versus uh, telephone or video appointments. And it doesn't, you know, it's not just about remote communities uh, being more reliant on video and, and telephone. Um, you know, there, I mean, there, is, there are stark contrasts, for example, NHS Ayrshire and Arran, 86% uh, of um, psychiatry appointments are, uh, or psychological therapy appointments are face-to-face, -face, just 14% telephone or remote, whereas... NHS Lanarkshire, for example, a, a similar kind of population demographic, I guess, has got just 32% face-to-face uh, and over two-thirds are video and telephone link. Do you, can you explain that variation? Uh, so I, I would offer some... I, I can't fully explain it, but I can offer some insight. Um, so in... Uh, in Primary care, for example, we, we, uh, there are many places with very limited premises that, that you, you can't house all the, the, the members of staff, especially where, where we've been trying to transform uh, a primary care and bring in um, an expanded multidisciplinary um, team. Um, the, so, and there are some differences in terms of, of pre preference, and I'd be interested to map, to, to map that activity against um, patient preference um, or clinician preference, but patient preference uh, and the patient experience predominantly. Um, but even at, with our current um, information technologies, we aren't doing a good job of mapping who has a preference to be, um, you know, to, to take a, a, an appointment as a phone call or a video call. But for, for some people, video conferencing works really well and they can uh, interact with services without... Um, without missing large amounts of the, their, their time in employment or, um, um, or giving up some of their caring responsibilities. Um, but I, I think that, that variation does need to be understood and, and looked into. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on to Graeme shortly, who's got a, a question about the role of the police. But before I do that, uh, Christine, I think you wanted to come in on this area as well before we move off it. Yeah, I just wanted to come in because, um, you know, it's quite very important to us that we make sure that we're not over medicalizing um, and, and life issues. So I think that there is a, a thing about do we have the right numbers to be able to meet needs? But again, it's how many of that needs. It's about mental health that is caused by um, social determinants of health that then needs a different approach. So I think if, if the roundtable agrees with me that we've all got mental health, We've all got physical health, we've all got emotional health, is about the state that they are in. That's what we're talking about here. And for some people, it's poor. They don't have an illness yet. They don't have a mental illness yet. So I think, you know, it's reflecting the needs and just focusing on reflecting the needs and then the number of the what sort of what was we then need as opposed to the numbers. Because if we get things right, we don't expect lots of people to be developing mental illness in the first place if it can be prevented from deteriorating to that stage. 
Thank, thanks, Christina. That's very helpful. Uh, I'm going to now ask Graham to um, uh, to kick us off on a, a couple of areas. Graham. Yeah. Thanks very much, convener. Um, before I speak about the police, uh, Derek, I'll be um, speaking to you about that. Obviously, um, I just want to go back on something that Chris said, and I raised this in our session last week, um, and it's about the difficulty that people are now facing, and you mentioned this earlier, of actually getting to see a GP. It has become much more difficult, uh, and you have to you have to almost get you have to get past the receptionist whereas before you used to be able to just pho phone up and ask for an appointment and you'd be given an appointment and now people are having to explain what's wrong with them to some to somebody who's not a gp and i think and i don't know if you'd agree with me i think that mu that must put people off um, and and particularly people with mental health they may just not want to discuss it. And so it will put people off. And if it's putting people off, then we're going to miss people. I just wonder what you think of that. So I, I, I don't know that it fully puts people... There's a lot of, pe lot of people it doesn't put off. I think it, it drives frustration and I th think it, it drives negative experience. At the moment, general practice and our, our GP workforce uh, faces a, a real difficult time. Uh, the, there are other parts of the system that, are, that, that I mentioned, the waiting lists, where there are long waiting lists. So people keep returning to us with problems that, that we've already referred them on, onward with uh, for knee replacements that they, uh, that they, they can't yet have. Uh, and so, that, so the, we are still dealing with their issues of needing pain, pain killing medicines and needing other, uh, dealing with other problems that, that, uh, uh, that rack up. We have a limited GP work workforce, uh, and some of the, the, the changes that introduced in, in recent times are to to um, bring in other uh, other types of workforce, um, ph pharmacists, physiotherapists, and they, they can deal with some specific um, issues. Um, but I say that this this combination then of of, of our GPs um, needing to needing to train more students, needing to cheat to to supervise more GP trainees, needing to 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 you know, offer input to, to this, this, this rapidly expanding team. Um, so we f find our GPs very, very stretched, uh, and we there at this constant demand, and, 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 and much of it driven by, by genuine need. Um, the, uh, and it's, it's very difficult to be a, a GP in that position where you can see, um, I mean, the, 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 the amount of contacts we have on a daily basis basis where we, we where we try and meet uh, where we try and I suppose we, we've needed these systems that we describe as triage where we have to try and understand who out of a you know a huge volume of, of, of people contacting a practice who you know who needs to be you know absolutely at the top of the list to see and it's not always those who you know who are shouting the, the loudest um, uh, you know and in amongst all this reaction um, all this reactive work um, there, there's a, a, a very clear danger that some of the, the, the planned care that we would be, be delivering, um, some of the, the, the proactive work, um, and, and I guess mental health especially falls into that area, where we would um, in pre previous times have, have, um, have sought out um, patients who we know who are vulnerable, who we know we haven't seen in, in, in a while, um, who you know we would be wary if they dropped off our radar. Um, uh, and it, it comes back to some of the, the issues that um, were raised, I, I think, by, by Katrina, Christina in, in particular, around about um, some 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 people out there um, we, we might ordinarily rely on uh, on co on coping in their normal role in society. And there's there's such pressures at the moment over the over the last while that it's yeah there, there's so many so many people turning to general practice to, to you know to ask um, to be seen um, and we know that that there's lots of people where the preference is I'd like to speak to my GP and I would like to not have to uh, 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 to explain myself about it but it's the, op an operational issue that we don't have um, GP capacity to meet that demand okay I'll, I'll move on from that because we could spend ages just on this one one subject but I do want to um, chat about the police if I can Derek uh, because it's a it's been a, a big concern of mine uh, for quite a while now, um, having spoken to 
police and my, my own patch. Uh, myself and the convener represent central Scotland, um, so that includes L Lanarkshire. Uh, and speaking to police in Lanarkshire, they're telling me, and I think the police are nationwide are saying the same thing, the amount of time that officers are spending just dealing with mental health cases can be as high as, I, mean, I found, found this an astonishing figure, and this was given to me locally, 80% of cases are dealing with mental health cases. And I've heard locally that we've had, we've had incidents where there are entire shifts of officers in A&E, sitting with people and not able to deal with other cases. That seems to me to be a ludicrous situation uh, and not a good use of resources. So I'll ask you to just comment on that uh, initially and then we can move on. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I've heard those anecdotal stories as well, so um, that, that's not a unique story. And I think HMICS have recently done the review. I think we're also provided similar evidence uh, on, on that. In terms of police officers going to the hospital um, for 80 per, or, or 80 by that 80 per cent, um, when we look at our stats, and we're getting better at understanding our demand through our demand productivity unit. That 80% figure probably covers a wider number of incidents. So, for example, concern for people, missing persons, assistant member of the public. It comes under quite a wide range of descriptors that get that 80% figure. But there's no doubt there's a huge element of that 80% figure are individuals who are suffering from mental health. There's no doubt about that. Um, we do often go to hospital, and there is that that demand issue for the NHS, and it's, it's no fault of theirs, that they have a capacity issue when we take them there. We do, we then, from our perspective, and, and people maybe say that the police are being risk averse, but I suppose our view is that we're investing in the vulnerability and the safety and protection of an individual. And I think that goes back to when we became Police Scotland and that unique point in the legislation that actually writes in our legislative purpose is to improve the safety and well-being of individuals. And we didn't probably have that in our purpose before we became Police Scotland. We've always done it as a police service regardless in terms of uh, supporting people with vulnerabilities. But what does that well-being mean? That well-being we're probably still wrestling a wee bit in terms of we need to define that in terms of our service provision. But if we define that in terms of our service provision, what does that mean for our partners' service provision? Because there's that unscheduled care element. And I think Police Scotland are not, and hopefully people will be supportive of this, are not taking the position that they have done down south, where there are certain areas have said, um, we are stepping back and we're not going to do that. Well, we think we've got a different legislative purpose. But we do have to work with partners to work out where that where that, that that kind of line stops, because we have to remove ourselves at some point. We have to go back to the what I would call traditional core policing requirements. But the reality is, mental health is now a core policing requirement. So what was traditional before needs to be redefined. Is mental health always going to have an impact on policing? Yes. Is policing always going to step up, in Scotland anyway, is policing always going to step up and make a commitment to deal with the most vulnerable in society? Yes. It's how we get the care services from statutory and non-statutory partners that fill the gap when an individual isn't admitted to a hospital. What do we do? Do we walk away and do we leave them vulnerable? Because we heard, as the evidence provided already, post-COVID, people have lost their... their um, their networks of support. There are some people who just don't have that family support, and and we find ourselves often, often filling that gap, n not not through choice, but because we're invested in the vulnerability of that individual. Okay. Um, well, yeah. I mean, officers on the ground will will tell you that, that I'm sure they've told you, as they'll tell any of us, that the police are risk averse. Um, and, and so that, that, and that's not criticism, by the way. That's just the, the reality. Um, and you mentioned the, the situation down south. U ultimately, this comes down to what is the best way of dealing with people who have mental health problems, people who need help. And so the question is, I suppose, is are the, are the police the best people to deal with that? Answer: Sometimes yes, often 
no. And so they've looked at they, they have looked at this down south. Um, they've got a system called Right Care, Right Person. Um, in in Humberside, Humberside Police took this up, um, and uh, they believe it's saved. I'll just quote the figures: uh, 1,400 officers offer, officer hour hours on average every month have been saved by adopting a different approach. Um, if you look at that across the whole of England, that could be up to a million police hours a year. So that, if you just take that, that that's, that's a good thing from a, a resources point of view if we deal with things differently. So I don't think we should completely rule out what they're doing in England. Uh, we should perhaps look, look at it and see if we can learn from it, because what we don't want is Police Scotland to be t tied up dealing with cases that really is not your job. So I, I would completely agree. So just to probably take on from, from the last comments, um, is it the police's job to fill that gap? We don't feel it, we don't feel it is. Uh, just to be blunt, we don't feel it is. But the, the, the commitment that we've made is that without having a proper plan and engagement and consultation with partners, we won't take that approach that England and Wales are doing without understanding the right place uh, kind of model. So we, but HMICS have, have commented on it as well. We will absolutely look at that and we'll review that. We've actually got a, a workshop coming up on the 22nd of November with partners um, to try and help us work towards what a new model is going to look like for Police Scotland. And we can only do that through collaboration. We realise that with, with, the, with the funding envelope that Police Scotland's got and the reducing police numbers based on that, we need to come up with a model, not only for mental health, but look at efficiencies across the board. But we are, we are looking at that. So that step in the 22nd of November is really important because we can't design that service without professionals from other, from other bodies. We have to listen to lived experience. There's the, the advisory group the HMICS use. We're going to look to see how, going forward, we listen to lived experience. And we will use our service design team to come up with, with new approaches and new models, but based on not just stopping and pulling back, because we think that is not what the public and certainly people with vulnerabilities require. We do have good practice going across Scotland. It's very hard to get a consistent approach because there's different health boards, different third sector. So to try and get a, a, a model that works everywhere is quite challenging. There is really good uh, learning coming out of uh, uh, Central Scotland area uh, in uh, Forth Valley around about a risk assess process. We talk, you talked about as being risk averse because we do, do obviously think about what happens and we'd, we'd be subject to a PERC investigation, as you know. So, so, so we're looking at the work that's been done in Forth Valley with police, partners, PERC, a proper clinical risk assessment that allows us to take an individual to a hospital and based on that assessment we can then move back but that's through partnership so we're looking at that can that be scaled up looking at geographical areas where we can we, we, mod, we pilot that and get into 2024 that's great that, yes sorry um just to alert you to the fact that uh, mike pavan and chris also want to come in on this question Oh, do they? Well, yeah. That's, that's, that's yes, it's not a, that's, that's it's not really a dialogue, good. it's a round table. No, no, no. Well, well it is. Uh, it's good to, good to know that other people want to come in on this, because it's really important. Mm -hmm. But I was just going to say that I think that's really encouraging what Derek said, that, you know, we have this, um, uh, well, project, I suppose you could call it, in Fourth Valley. Uh, I think I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Um, and the discussions coming up um, on November the 22nd. 22nd. Yeah. So I think, I think that's great. Um, so if, if, if we're looking at it, if we can get to a system where even if police are called out, that you can then contact somebody else and they can, they can take on the case, that would be good. So I don't know, convener, who you want to bring in. Well, I'm going to bring them in in that order, I think. I'm going to invite Mike, first of all, uh, if you want to... Um, uh, come in, uh, then I'll go to you, Pavan, and then uh, I'll bring in Chris in the committee room. So, Mike, first of all. Thank you, thank you Richard. And, and j just to pick up on, on what Graham was saying there, I mean, as a social worker of 30 plus years' experience, having delivered services in homelessness, addictions, and, and mental health, I have nothing but admiration 
for the way police call and <coughs> excuse me, I'm full of a cold. For the way police call and work with the most vulnerable and those within crisis here in Scotland. Uh, some examples in relation to how we're trying to plug that gap here in Scotland. To my knowledge, there are only two commission services, multi-agency services working alongside NHS Lothian and NHS Tayside, the Crisis Centre in Edinburgh and the Hope Centre in Dundee, which are attempts to try and address some of the issues that have been highlighted there by Police Scotland in delivering what we would call a physical walk-in a mental health crisis service. So, so there are some areas of good work out there, uh, but, but they're few and far between. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Uh, Pavan. Thank you. Um, I, I'd, I'd echo a lot of what Derek had said and also what Mike had said in terms of the very different context in Scotland in terms of our working relationships with Police Scotland, which is far more collaborative. And I would have real grave concern about any move towards the unilateral approach, which was adopted by the Met to withdraw, and then look at what needs to be put in place. I think that puts people at real risk, and these are some of the most vulnerable people. We are going to be part of the collaborative approach that Derek described in terms of working through to find what the right model for us in Scotland is. And I think there's elements of learning from experience down south. But I also wanted to highlight that there are actually lots of examples of very good practice. Derek, uh, Mike mentioned a couple. Another example is the mental health assessment unit, which acts as a diversion from a and &E. So you know, officers don't need to be stuck in A&Es for five, six, eight hours. If you have a mental health difficulty, uh, a mental health crisis, you go straight into the mental health assessment unit where you're seen by a specialist rather than having to go through the generic process. But all of these things need funded, and I think that is the real challenge. So the Humber example, the difference is in Humber, the investment in mental health services as a proportion of overall health spend is about 13%. That is almost exactly the double, the exact double of what some of the other board areas in Scotland spend, where it's an average of about 6.57%. And you get what you pay for. Ultimately, that is the challenge. We need dedicated investment in all components of the service, specialist services, where there's a statutory role for someone who's presenting in crisis, where there might be a risk to themselves or to others all the way through to multi-agency examples in the way that Mike's described or uh, in other third sector partners. And we haven't seen that joined up process of looking at making long-term investment decisions, not year by year decisions, but long-term investment decisions, especially in terms of third sector supports and commission services that allow for that collaborative shift away from the police acting as a first responder in a lot of these circumstances. Uh, thanks, Pavan. I'm, I'm going to bring in Stephen, because we've not heard from Stephen yet, and then I'll bring uh, Chris in for a brief comment before we move on. No, it, it's, it's just so that the point that, um, that this is failure, that a lot of this is failure demand is made. I mean, a, a lot of our people are quite upfront about the fact that they are not, they don't have the capacity or the numbers or, or the range to get into people's to help people before it reaches the kind of crisis point that does involve the police indeed they are only getting involved with people after incidents and behaviors that have involved the police and really you know if you want to reduce the demand on police you you there's a, a strong strong case for interventions downstream so to speak in services like housing in services like um the, the, the various psychological therapies and so on that people have been saying. We, we shouldn't have the police involvement to the extent that we have because we shouldn't have as many people in crisis as we have. And there are ways to prevent that if we're serious about it. Thanks, that's helpful. Chris. Uh, yeah, that, I was going to make that point. We, and we, we do have some very good uh, examples of multi-agency working um, but I would also f the one element we haven't flagged up some some people have insight that they um, that they have a mental health 
problem, that they, that they need help. There are, of course, others that, that don't have insight uh, where their, their fr friends or relatives may be um, flagging up concerns either to health services or um, to, to the to police. Uh, and I guess especially if there's um, uh, any suspicion of a, of a threat of violence or, um, um, uh, you know, other... Um, other situations where the, the, the police have specific skills that, that, uh, uh, and, and capacity resources that they can offer. Uh, and with an ageing population, I think we are speak, seeing more and more vulnerable people uh, where carers um, um, uh, or relatives live um, far away uh, where there are concerns about well-being. Yeah, thanks. So I, I think that's all been really useful, and I thank um, everyone for uh, contributing to that. Um, I should say that the, the, the MET system, my understanding of the, Met, the Metropol Metropolitan Police system is that they only respond to 999 mental health calls where there's an immediate threat to life. Um, of course, I'm not sure how you're meant to judge that um, over, over the phone. That seems to me to be a rather blunt system. So I think if we can just Im improve the way we, we deal with things um, I don't know, convener, if we've got time to um, ask the uh, panellists about the the model that's used in Trieste. I don't know if you want me to... Yeah, I mean, if, if uh, anyone's got any views um, yeah. about that, which is highlighted in the report from uh, the Auditor General, the Accounts Commission, then I would be interested to get their views. It's about a, a more kind of community-based organisation, a walk-in. Maybe, maybe uh, Anne, that's something you would have a, a perspective on. But anyway, Graham. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is mentioned in the report. Um, so this is Trieste in Italy, where um, they've, they've set up a, essentially a new, a new way of dealing with mental health. Um, and it operates through a network of mental health centres. They operate 24 hours a day. You don't need an appointment. You just walk in. Um, uh, so not only has it improved the way mental health uh, is dealt with in that area, it's also cheaper than what was there before. Now, that's not why you do it, but it's just ended up that way. So I don't know. But don't comment if you've not read this section or if you don't know about it, but if you have read the, the section and you've got any views about it, um, I think we'll be keen to hear. I think, I think uh, both Anne and Mike have indicated they want to come in, and I think because Christine wanted to come in on a, on a previous point, so um, if um, Anne and Mike might be the ideal candidates to uh, tell us about their insights into this kind of approach. Beginning with Anne. Yep, um, Trest I've known about for as long as it's taken for to recover from the death of my son. Um, between Trest uh, and Pieta system in Ireland and the Maytree Foundation, I've based Chris's house on that anyone can access in crisis mental health service at any time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And I'm very, very proud that we've got a very, very high success rate in Chris's house. We're not a big player. We don't advertise. We can't advertise. Um, Dr. Pavan, you mentioned funding. We don't get funding. We're self-funded, which limits us and how much we can expand. Uh, We've we set I, I set this up with my vision. I my background is social science. That's my education. Obviously, I've got bought on since I started Chris's house, but it's a very very successful um, model. the The problem in our country, as opposed to Italy, there's something in Brazil as well, uh, or Peru, is red tape and this frightened, as you say, risk averse, risk averse. Uh, we're all tied up in red tape. We're all tied up in red tape. But I, I think in fairness, anti-crisis, and I understand the crisis um, that they live in has, has, is no longer working. That's what I, I'm, I'm hearing whether I'm right. You can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, because of the red tape have made it that they have to be, a, you know, the, the a health and social care thing that they all live in centres so they're down institutions so they can't get it properly uh, because of regulations. 
so we get tied up with regulations and in Chrissy's house, I'm glad to see that we are independent and we do work uh, on a person-centred basis on the person's needs. And when we can influence outside agencies, as in housing or social work or anything else, we do. But we're not always recognised as a, a statutory, we're not, we're not recognised like a statutory service. So we don't have the teeth that other people have. Hopefully that will come in time once we've proven the success of Chrissy's House and how successful we are. So, yes, the Trieste system is absolutely what we need, what everyone needs, is people to access when they're in crisis. They're not in crisis in three weeks. They're not in crisis in two days. We don't organise crisis. It happens when it happens, and they have to be attended to. So that's all I'll say on it. I hope that answers what you think. That's a very, very good service. Thanks, Anne. Thank that's you. Thanks, Anne. That's very, very helpful. Uh, Mike, I'm going to bring you in next, and then um, I've got Christina and uh, Pavan. But Mike, to you next. Thank you, Richard. And just to answer Graham's question, as somebody that's uh, studied the Trieste model for a number of years, Graham, the earlier intervention in crisis will always be more cost-effective. Uh, we know that. All the research is there. You don't need to be Albert Einstein to work that one out. Uh, and the point that Anne makes is really good. Uh, we do have some difficulties in this country around registration and the role of the care inspector in relation to how we develop these models in Scotland. And certainly that's something that I would encourage the committee to look at and, 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 and talk to those people with lived experience about the really positive outcomes that a model such as the TS model has been able to achieve for them. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Christina. So I think I, I do agree with, with what most people have said, apart from the Italian sort of like model. So I think we are chasing, we've got a crisis model, which is the reason the police are having to deal with people that have got a mental health crisis and all the systems. So all the public sector have got a crisis model and most of the cases they're seeing is a cry for help. Um, and I think we then need to change behaviour. So I wonder what needs to come out from here is to recognise that behaviour change is something that we need to do. Because this is the reason why the thought sector is probably not as recognised as the way that it should be recognised. And the reason why even the community link workers are not sustainable, despite delivering fantastic services, the GPs, the community sector, the patients actually saying this saved my life, Yet, in Glasgow, they are about to slash the number of link workers by a third. So I think there has to be an acknowledgement here. What are we talking about when we talk about mental health? Are we talking about mental health in terms of poor mental health? Are we serious about preventing people from deteriorating or what? And we have got a massive example in um, um, Highlands custody link worker. They work with the police. That is uh, under the Community Justice Partnership Program. We've got examples here. We've got link workers that they can refer us from the police. But of course, it has to be uh, looking at the pathway and looking at what, what is the need from what the need is. We can then design pathways and look at step-down models to then address that. So I don't think we, I think we need to speak with the community programs. We need to speak with the link workers, find out what they're already doing, how they're working with the criminal justice system, what the need is like, and then how do we increase capacity from there? But we can't do that if we don't recognize that we're not an optional addition as a workforce. Thanks. Thanks, Christina. That's a point forcefully made. I've got um, uh, Pavan to come in, and then I'm going to turn to Colin to put some questions. Pavan, on, on the Trieste model, perhaps? Yep, um, thank you. So we're very aware of the Trieste model, and I've studied it. I've been involved in looking at it in detail in at evaluation for over a decade, and it's been around for about three times that long. Um, and the Trieste model is also what guided the shift to community mental health in Scotland, it's, it's not new. We've worked on that for the last 20, 30 years. Unfortunately, it's a job half done. Um, so we made the shift, we shut the asylums, we've moved into the community, and then we kind of lost interest. Um, I would also disagree with the point Christina made that the public se uh, sector model is a crisis model. I would disagree with that wholeheartedly. Our model is very much a model of looking after people in the long term, people with severe and enduring mental illnesses, and I'm making the distinction between poor mental health 
and a severe and enduring mental illness. I'm talking about people with bipolar disorder, with psychosis, severe OCD, severe eating disorders, which are in some cases lifelong conditions, which have a huge impact. I've seen people for the last 20 years that I've been working as a psychiatrist, and I'll see them for the next 20 years while I continue to work as a psychiatrist. These are long-term relationships that we build with people. The challenge has been that we've made investment in the community, we've started that process, and we've lost sight of it. There needs to be a focus on prevention, absolutely, but not at the cost of investing in services, in specialist services as well. It's not an either or model. And it's a bit like saying, we'll invest in smoking cessation, but we don't need to worry about cancer services. These are generational shifts. And prevention takes place across multiple levels. There's prevention of a crisis, which is prevention, which is what specialist mental health services provide, all the way through to looking at housing and employment and educational resources, which is primary prevention. And sometimes these conversations get simplified into an all or nothing position that somehow if we invest early, we invest in prevention, we don't, we're not going to have mental illness. And that's not the case. I guess the point I'm, make, I'm trying to make about Trieste is it's, it's a very good system, but it requires, going back to what I said, that long-term strategic vision and a commitment that is not measured in one year, two year, five year cycles, but a 10 to 15 year cycle. Th thank you. That's a, that, that's a very clear point of view. Um, I'm, before we finish this section, I'm going to give a, a last word to Derek before I bring Colin in. Derek. No, I appreciate it. I'll keep it really brief. It's probably just to close in what Dr. Pavan just said. That strategic vision and that 10 to 15 year vision of a 24 hour service is what will reduce your policing demand. Because until there is mental health services that are available 24 seven, the police will continue to fill that gap. So that I would just wholeheartedly endorse what's been said. Thank you, and thanks for being succinct. Colin, over to you. Thank you, Vera. I'd like to look at uh, some aspects of uh, access to support, and uh, I'll start with GPs, so Chris, I'll put you on the rack first. Um, my experience as an MSP is we do get people coming in who have mental health issues to a greater or lesser extent. Um, and usually we pass the information back to their surgery and we get zero um, feedback for confidentiality reasons. Um, often the same person is back in a month later with still the same problem. So we never know what's happened. Anecdotally, although we don't hear in the majority of cases, anecdotally, we hear, as long as they're not a danger to others, they're not fussed. But, for example, someone who has a belief that they're being uh, under police surveillance or MI5 or whatever, they're very distressed because they truly believe that. So it seems that nothing's being done in respect to that. So I'm asking about the role of the GPs. What support you need to better support uh, mental health needs of patients? But, uh, wait, wait. Where is, where is the, uh, the break there? Yes, um, so uh, and I, I would say that I would firstly start by speaking generally and saying that, that, that all GP practices look at their, their access arrangements and, uh, and we're, you find we're continually changing how to, to, to try and understand where there is need and, and need that, 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 uh, to, to try and deal with that. So above and beyond the demand. Um, the, sometimes we're hampered by um, old um, tele telephony systems, for example, where there's a limit to how many people can um, uh, can contact the practice at one time, uh, and, and so sometimes we see um, surges of of people trying to contact the practice all at once. And I guess the Monday morning um, sort of scramble for uh, for appointments is one example. So we we try and introduce other ways of people getting in touch. So um, digital ways where people can send in a f form or uh, and so all all the time we're trying to to, to find ways to to allow patients to and to come into the to the system. Where we've got 
um, I highlighted earlier, where we've got um, a, a limited GP workforce, and especially where that workforce is is needing to attend to other tasks in terms of educational tasks, other supervision of other other clinicians, other members of the team, um, the, we we can really become stretched. On the on the and, and on the back of that, as you've picked up on, uh, continuity is is a big thing in general practice. When when we are able to to afford continuity, which doesn't always need to be the same GP, it can be different d different clinicians, different um, members of the team. But where where a, 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 the, I should say the evidence is around the continuity of um, uh, on general practitioners rather than uh, studies on the other members of the team. But where someone feels that they, that they are known, where they, where they are listened to, where, where their issues are, are understood, even if we can't fix all of those issues, uh, they, 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 they can have a better sense of, um, a better sense that, that, that they're doing okay. Um, and, and I absolutely accept what you're saying about some of the, the frustrations that people, um, that, that people will voice when they, they feel they aren't able to, to access a, a, a system, um, sometimes through, through no fault of their own. Um, but again, I, I would highlight that there are uh, there are a lot of people um, across primary care, um, and, and especially in terms of GPs who, who want, um, you know, who, who want patients to to have a, a straightforward route, um, and especially for those who have um, need um, to, to be to be seen in a, in a timely way. There's there's a wide range of uh, mental health issues. It's uh, you know, it's not not just one particular issue for people. The process is described as slow and complicated to get support. What happens when people are not eligible for specialist services but still have mental health challenges? And I'll throw that open obviously to, to everybody. I think, um, I think uh, Pavan wanted to come in on uh, the point about the role of GPs, and you might have a view on this as well, and then if other people indicate, we'll, we'll bring you in too. Thank you. I suppose the point I would make links into both the questions that are being discussed. Um, I, I guess one of the first things I was going to say in terms of some of the challenges in the interface between primary and secondary care is the capacity for communication, but also for expertise, for mental health expertise, to be available within the primary care setting. That is a real challenge because our primary and secondary care services tend to work with quite distinct boundaries, and that can be a real challenge when someone doesn't neatly fit within those boundaries. Some of the work that has been undertaken around expanding the provision of mental health and well-being services in primary care would have been would have gone a long way in addressing some of those challenges. The initial challenge described about how you get access to specialist services, how do you get access to advice to determine what would be the best service, and how do you get access to advice to determine what might be alternatives if they don't meet the threshold for specialist services. There are really good models, for example, down south in Cambridgeshire, a model that has been in place for several years. And the aspiration here in Scotland was that we would expand quite significantly the provision of mental health specialists and third sector mental health provision within the primary care setting with the expansion of multidisciplinary teams with input from psychiatrists, from psychologists, but also from link workers and third sector partners. All of that has been on hold since the cut to the budget, which was announced uh, in the emergency review in December last year. And that is the challenge. This is a much needed resource. It's a resource that can be provided. We've got very good idea of how it could be provided, but it does need new investment. And that is what the 32 million, which was earmarked for it, would have delivered, would have addressed a lot of those challenges, which also would have addressed the challenges of, well, what are the alternatives if they don't meet the threshold for specialist mental health services? The other point I also wanted to make is that when we talk about someone being rejected by a specialist mental health service, it's not simply about gatekeeping. It's not simply about keeping people out. It can also be that actually their needs are not met within a specialist mental health service, within the model of care that is provided within a psychiatric service. It is also because that might not be actually helpful to that individual and that there should be alternatives. The challenge, of course, is those alternatives don't exist, and that's why it becomes a problem. 
But sometimes a bad alternative is not a good substitute for no alternative. I think it's also important to highlight that and keep that in mind. On one or two of the points you made there, between primary health care and moving into secondary, who does the triage? How does it work? Who decides on the priority for that particular case? In practice, it's based on the information provided in the referral, and that triage and that decision is made within the secondary care service. So that is on the basis of what the secondary care service provides. So if it's an adult community mental health team, we would look at the information provided in the referral by the GP. Um, we would look at whether the individual's needs are best met within the secondary care service. Sometimes if we can identify an alternative service, we would signpost the individual to that alternative service. But that triage process is undertaken by clinicians within the secondary care service. Okay. Colin. Uh, Colin. Just to expand, I don't know if there's anybody Yeah, there are. There are. I'll, can, I'll bring them in before okay. you go on to your next question, if that's okay. So, um, and I'm conscious, Stephen, that Unison's got a lot of mental health nurses amongst its membership, and you might have a, a, a view on this. I'll come to you in a second. But first of all, um, remotely, I've got both Christina and Mike want to come in uh, on these points. So I'm going to bring Christina, I'll bring you in first. Yeah, so I think that the, the thing is that, that the referral and, and the way we describe mental health is all kind of like linked. So you've got those who've got mental illnesses, like Pavan ha, ha, has listed, and those whose mental health is as a result of all the issues that don't need a clinical treatment and a non-clinical approach like the link workers work. So we need to figure that out and just making sure people are not bouncing around the system. And the, the uh, specialist services, they need to be aware of what link workers do and what they're not able to do so that we're then very clear on what is that middle ground because that is what we are finding is where people don't fit into any box and they're just bouncing around the system the referrals coming back to the gp whereas there might be community-based uh, link workers that are that are based in the community or those that are based in primary care that can pick that up so i think we need to discuss you know and have a look at what the um, the evidence is saying and what the data is saying and take a personalized approach we need to take a personalized approach to mental health. Some people respond better to a non-clinical approach. Some people respond better to a clinical approach. But policing everyone into one list might mean that people might be waiting in the list inappropriately, and we're not able to identify what step-down model that they might need. You're talking there. I was just thinking, what's the extent to which people are actually aware of the different types of support that exists? And I'm thinking here, quite clearly the, the, the role of community link workers. How aware are, are, are people in general of this? Well, they're not very, so I gave evidence to the alternative uh, pathways to primary care, um, you know, uh, health and, and, and sports select committee. And it's because we haven't got a universal access in primary care. And I know that, that that's a challenge. We need to have universal access to community link workers across all GP practices in Scotland, because most of the mental health works happens in primary care and community care. That's what the evidence does suggest. So not being able to meet that then means it's quite very difficult to do a universal campaign. But now the current um, first minister, when he was the health secretary, has said to him, we needed a national campaign. We needed a national campaign to raise awareness of the support that can be provided by community link workers. But we need capacity. When people don't value that we are we are not an optional addition, then how it's not sustainable. I mean, lots of link workers in Glasgow right now, they don't know if their job is guaranteed. So those sort of approach is sort of like a setback. We bring in an additional workforce and we promise the public and now they're getting used to that. We take that away. So that is wrong. I think we really need to think about what is it that we're doing here? Are we serious with mental health? Are we really, really serious about helping people to live well in good health? Or are we just ticking boxes? Because if we're not serious with the link workers and what they bring, it's just a letdown to patients. Thanks, Christina. I'm, I'm going to go back to the question that uh, Colin put around the description in the report of um, access being slow and complicated. And I'm going to bring in Mike. Um, and uh, then I'll come to Stephen. I think Anne wants to come in in this area too, but uh, Mike, remotely, if you want to uh, give us your view on that, that would be really helpful. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Colin, just, just to pick up on your question, 
I mean, one of the best examples we've had here in Scotland over the last two or three years has been the DBI programme, uh, the Brief Intervention Programme, into working with people who are in various states of distress and anything up to suicidal ideation. And, and if we look at the outcomes that we've achieved in relation to that in the recent evaluation, we can see just how valuable it has been in diverting people away from uh, clinical services or statutory mental health uh, wards, or indeed uh, the role that the police uh, play that's been highlighted here earlier. One of the difficulties we have is, is that, however, the Scottish Government will no longer provide dedicated funding for DBI uh, as of March 24, and uh, this will be expected to be reflected in health and social care budgets. Uh, and as the report itself points out in point 24, uh, this could result in varying quality and availability of DBI services across Scotland. So, I, I, again, going back to what Pavan said about you know, Trieste, you know, if you, if you start a model and you build a model that's proving to be really, really good and successful, you know, think long and hard about how we take that forward. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Stephen and then Anne remotely. Um, to take Colin's final question, how aware are people of, of what's out there? Um, I, I, I don't wish to be harsh on doctors here, but people don't always need doctors. Um, but we are wired to think that you must see the doctor. If you've not seen the doctor, you've not seen anybody. And there are a whole, road, a whole load of other alternatives that have been out there for a while, but progressed. You know, there's, there's much more online uh, access to information and even, you know, attempts at therapy. There's uh, NHS 24, you know, in the Breathing Space programme. I mean, quite a lot I could say about how they operate. But nonetheless, they are there. There are things there. And we need to get away from, if we are going to create a sustainable set of mental health services, we need to get away from the idea that everybody must always see a doctor. Um, even, I, I suspect, initially, you know, I mean, maybe you need a doctor to get, go down the social prescribing route that, of, of the, the sort of link workers that Christina um, is arguing for. But you don't always need a doctor to deal with everything. There are other areas out there, and I don't think it's been... I think you need a cultural shift there, quite how you develop that, I'm not sure. But we do need more of an effort to get these other clinical professionals uh, and people with expertise involved and uh, available for people. I could talk about staffing, but I'll, I suspect we'll get to that later. Th thanks. That's a really helpful perspective to bring in. Um, I'm going to turn to Anne uh, for your view on this, uh, whether it's the link workers, the um, what happens to people that fall through uh, the cracks. Yeah. Um, first of all, I would like to go back to what um, Pavan said about the, the people with the long-term mental illness. And he also picked up on the bad alternatives there are bad alternatives because quite often, and the government are using a lot of peer support workers, and there's very, very good peer support workers, very, very good link workers. But there's also people that think they're armchair psychologists. There's a place for people, everyone, and there's but people need to know their limitations. People need to know their limitations. Now we're a non-medical centre, non-clinical. We talk about clinical here. My people, you know, they're, they're, they're psychotherapists, they're at master's level that work in here. But we also know that we can't, we need, we need clinical services, we need medication in some points, but we need to get to the trauma that's caused people to have the long-term mental health, you know, illness that they have. It's not always just um, chemical imbalance, you know, something may have caused it, but a lot of trauma work needs to be done. We need to be a lot more trauma informed. Um, on on the be, on the best practice, the DBI. Mike, it's wonderful that you brought that up, because DBI is a short term, and it's it's, it's short term. But now, like 
our services like yourself are finding where the flies hold up the ceiling because when they've got nowhere else to send them, we're getting them. When the other people are getting paid to do a job that they're not doing. Do you know, and the, the waiting list, and I, I, I know it comes in longer, the waiting list to see a specialist or to see the specialist service. I've got three psychologists working here. To see a specialist service, that if, if somebody presents to me um, in a psychotic, like, you know, presenting in some psychotic form, and I can't get there to see someone that day, what am I supposed to do? They're psychotic, they're a danger to themselves and maybe a danger to other people. You know, I'm very lucky uh, in Lanarkshire that the police are aware of us. The police often will bring people in that have been dismissed after being on a train line. The police have taken them to the hospital, brought them back in, but they're deemed fit, they're deemed that they've got capacity. A lot of people know the right things to say. Everybody has to get this joined up, you know, this joined up service and respect everybody else's input. If we respect each other's input and know the need and know that there is no particular hierarchy, there is no particular hierarchy, and I understand that everybody thinks their, their model is the best model, but as somebody says, there has to be a shift. There has to be a shift to other people, like peer, peer support workers, link workers, psychiatry. We all have to work together. We're all saying we're working together, but we're not. We're not. But very often, and probably Michael know this as CEO in, in Penumbra, we're fighting fires all the time. So we sit here, it's very unusual for me to be sitting in a meeting, any meeting, because I don't take time to sit in meetings because I'm busy working with what we're working with on a daily basis. Do you know, if I gave you our figures, you would probably think, well, that's that's a small amount compared to the statutory services. But it's not a small amount for the size of your organisation. You know? But I want our organisation to get bigger and bigger. But we can only do that when people actually start to work together and respect what each other do. I don't know if that takes away from the point, and it is a bit long-winded, but I get really upset when people think they can work with bipolar or I would never touch any of doing anything disorder or anorexia because I don't have the team even to work with that. So I know that that's not for us. You know, it's not about getting numbers here. It's about getting the best for the people. And that's why I try to model as, as near as I can to the dress model because I've lost my son to suicide. And we should all sit up and take note and stop ticking boxes and do the work and do the job. And I know we're all sitting here because we are doing it. But I'm 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 pretty passionate about it. And I get I get I get passionate when I'm speaking and I'm I'm not making an apology for it. Uh, there's too many variables when we're dealing with people's mental unwellness. That goes for local local um, council areas, personalities that are dealing with people that are, have got compassion fatigue. We, we, we need to get this all on a level and awareness of the link workers, awareness of what people can do and what people are here to do, not tick the boxes to do it. That's all I'll say. Thanks. Thank you. Colin. On the back of uh, what Anne's saying there, it's probably worth highlighting that from the report, there's a huge variability on primary care mental health services, third sector services and peer support across Scotland. I don't know what extent that arises from a greater or lesser uh, knowledge and awareness of the different forms of support that exist. But I'd be interested in hearing uh, any comments on that, any, 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 anything that could be done better, or 
how do we join this up? Anne's highlighted that not, not everything is joined up. How do we fix that? Chris, I think, wants to have a go at answering that question. Chris. Yeah, it's a, it's a big one. And I think a lot of the in interfaces that are there um, uh, don't all, aren't always reviewed in, in the way, in the continuous feedback loop that, that we need. Um, so uh, coming back to, you, you asked about, about the referral process. And so in, uh, in, in Scotland, we've got an electronic way of passing up th things that are non-emergency. Um, if you have physical health mm -hmm. problems, then there's a category that uh, of urgent sus suspicion of cancer that, that where you are on a very um, sort of uh, fast waiting list, that that option doesn't exist in, in, in mental health. Um, but that the, the, this system does allow information to be structured in terms of how we pass it on. Um, but how that information is then received and, and reviewed. So, uh, for example, in my local area, it, that the referrals are, are reviewed by a, a, a team uh, who consider which which service is available locally to, to deal with it, and they give very prompt feedback to, to, to me as a referrer. Uh, and, and it's that feedback that, that sort of supports the referring behaviour and drives drives things, makes sure that I'm putting the right uh, amount of, you know, l level of detail in and balancing that with the, the speed of, of, of passing things along the line. So although we're two separate teams, because there's adequate communication, uh, the, the, the system functions functions well. Uh, and I referred to, to, mentioned earlier that there are there are systems where which are under such pressure or where, where the, 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 the where the feedback is simply a, a rejection or a referral uh, um, and that there's some we mentioned there's some conditions so ADHD for example that where, where we've seen such a, 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 a change such a massive rise in demand that the the, the, set, the specialist services there need to, need to try and uh, I, I, again, identify who are at the most of at the need or who the, the service can provide for. So we'll then, in response to referral, we'll, we'll, we'll send back a, 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 um, a, you know, a counter request asking, you know, would, would your would your patient be wishing to take me medication? You know, what what, um, what will they hope from from having a diagnosis? Um, uh, and so where, where the, the the specialist service will try and sense check the the, the referral. Um, but while we've got stresses, uh, say I think feedbacks the the, the the key to overcoming that. Um, we are really uh, up against the clock, and so I'm I am, I'm going to apologise to a couple of people that did want to come in on this point, but I'm going to need to move things on, uh, and in because we've got some really quite important areas yet to be covered, uh, and I'm going to invite Willie in to lead us off on the next section. Willie. Okay, thanks very much, convener. What, what a really um, important discussion we're having, and to hear Anne speaking in the way she has done, Richard, is, is really quite an important uh, thing for this committee to have heard. It's, it's one of the most moving contributions I've heard for a, in my long experience as an MSP in the Parliament, so thanks for doing that, Anne. Um, Richard, while the committee was in discussion there, the government's announced an extra million quid for the Community Link Worker uh, Health and Social Care Partnership in Glasgow. Glasgow. So that's a wee bit of good news coming in that Christiana will probably be delighted to hear and there'll be no doubt there'll be a clamour from other health boards to get something similar. So that's quite good. I just wanted to ask uh, the panellists some views on how we can improve these services and I'm think thinking in particular about the Auditor General's comments about the kind of cluttered landscape and the structures that we have and so on. We've got integrated joint boards, health and social care partnerships. We, we often don't have compatible systems to share information and so on. So just anyone who has a view on this, I'd really be obliged to, to give us a few thoughts on how we might improve this situation. So it's Dr. questions on the kind of governance uh, architecture and whether it works and fits together well yes. or not. Um, I think Williams, Chris is indicating that he wants to come in, uh, first of all, and if other people um, have a view, just let us know. You don't have to have a view either, of course. Chris. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll speak firstly on, on behalf of my psychiatry colleagues, and, and, and I know that they, they, they were very 
um, fearful about some of the reorganisation pr proposals with the National Care Service uh, about the, the, you know, having the, these the clinical staff um, sort of a, in a governance structure that's based around social, social care, for example. Uh, and, and Pavan might want, want wish to pick up on that. Um, but in terms of information sharing, um, we, we frequently hear a desire that, that people that people in, within a system don't want to be repeating their their story. That they think that um, uh, people, that clinicians, that other part, administrative parts of the team can access the, the information, uh, and at the same time they, they they find these information governance barriers that are set. That set up with, with very good good intention, and it says the actual opera, operationalisation um, and, and the, the the legal um, sort of fears round about that, as well as that the, our our information technology systems um, aren't good enough yet for us to easily be able to uh, to have that rule based access that we need for uh, for, for good, that good information sharing. Um, uh, Pavan wants to come in, and also Mike and Christina. So uh, Pavan, maybe you first of all. Thank you. That, that's really helpful. And, and governance has been a real challenge. And you know, the moot integration has unfortunately meant nothing but fragmentation for mental health more than anything else. Um, there's been duplication of governance structures, lack of coordination and planning due to a lack of clarity about responsibility between IJBs, HSCPs, and boards. Um, and in most cases, it has felt that mental health has come as an afterthought, and that is exactly how it's felt within the National Care Service. The reference to mental health was a paragraph. It has continued to be an afterthought in all the planning. Most of the reference has been to social care rather than thinking about mental health in a much broader holistic sense. And it also seems to not recognize the link between physical health and mental health. It seems to treat it as two very separate, distinct things, rather than something that is part and parcel of an individual. It's almost like we'll separate the physical health, put it in one section, we'll separate the mental health, put it in another section, and expect all of that to automatically come together. So I think that has been my experience, personally, of being a clinician on the ground. We've got huge amounts of red tape due to duplication of governance structures across the board areas, across IJBs, and we don't know what the National Care Service is going to bring in. And the points that Chris has made around communication is a huge challenge that we all use different communication systems. And if anything, that fragmentation is worsening. And a lot of that, certainly my sense, our sense has been that it comes to not recognizing the importance of mental health services and mental health as something that needs to be a priority in terms of planning, in terms of structures, that it seems to be something that gets pushed into the background and moved or fit in after other decisions have been made. And that is our grave concern about the National Care Service. Everything we've seen so far has reiterated that concern that mental health does seem to be an afterthought that it seems to be focused on the care provision and that mental health support, care and treatment comes as an afterthought to be fit in on either or rather than thinking specifically about mental health services needs. And that is a real challenge. It's a real challenge to have that heard. And that contributes to the fragmentation and the lack of joined up working integration that we've touched on at various points all through this discussion. Thanks, Pavan. I mean, particularly on this point of governance, uh, Mike, I'm going to turn to you next for your for your thoughts, and then Christina, I'll come to you, and then to Stephen in the room here. But uh, Mike, first of all, uh, th thank you, Richard. And I mean, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with everything that Pavan said there, and and you know, I don't know what shape or or structure the NCS will take. Uh, but you know, until we have that in front of us, it's concerning that, that mental health will be, you know, the, the, the poorer uh, for being lost within a structure that will be dominated by possibly older people's services. You know, and, and, and that's that's a big, big concern. I have the privilege of co-chairing the biggest test of change in social care in Scotland, in the city of Aberdeen, uh, GCC. What we've managed to do there is, is put 
mental health on an equal standing alongside older people's care, uh, learning difficulties and, and personal care. And our whole drive is to move away from a time and task model to one focused on outcomes for individuals. And, and that has to be the direction of travel uh, for everything we do in mental health and in social care. And uh, you know, it is a real concern that, that you know, unless we focus on outcomes for people, we will continue to focus on the services that we can deliver as opposed to the services that we need to deliver. Thanks, that's really well put, Mike. Uh, Christina, to you, before I bring in Stephen. Christina. Thank you. So I think, I mean, healthcare is holistic, isn't it? So it, it's about joining everything up. And, and I think that the link workers are in a unique position because we are community people who've managed to be uh, embedded in some uh, GP practices and some of the clinical teams. So we find ourselves as being a very strong link between the community and the clinical services, which then means there is an opportunity to do holistic healthcare and do the biopsychosocial work, which I, I would assume we've always wanted to do and the continuity of care not lost. Now, the challenge is we need to be able to follow the entire person's journey. And that is what is not being enabled, even with the, um, uh, the, the, the funding commitment in, in terms of the link workers, just paying for the, you know, we're not looking at the digital infrastructure and the information governance, and that then helps us to, um, you know, check what we're doing. So I think the, the, the PRSB, which is the professional standards body, they managed to uh, produce an information uh, standards, which... Um, you know, they said all the all the four nations. It's relevant to all the four nations. So I, I think that that's something that we need to kind of like look at and see how can we strengthen our systems. Because I mean, with the work that our members do, the traditional way in the clinical systems is not um, enabling us to capture all the information that we need to capture. Um, and then that then helps us to capture some of the social data and what's going on in the community. And that should help to also then drive um, data driven, informed um, community arrangements as well. Thanks for that. Stephen. Um, would that the inadequacies of the National Care Scotland Bill were restricted to mental health. However, that's for another day. Um, but we should remember that when that bill was proposed, the Minister would talk about a, a, a system combining social work, social care and community health, as if this was a seamless continuity. And, and of course it isn't. And I mean, it's just obvious from the discussion here today about how many mental health services or services that contribute to improving mental health are inextricably linked with local government, for example. I mean, you know, this, and you know, things like social care and housing. It's not something that can be easily or should be either easily separated from everything else, or indeed just lumped in with everything else. You need to have a dynamic. And then the care service bill is in itself an attempt to deal with uh, inadequacies that are perceived in the bill that was put through in 24, came into operation in 2014, the joint working bill. And that in itself was about the 15th older people than me might remember have go at integrating health and social care. And what I think we should have learned from all this is it's not actually structures that matter. You, you get d better delivery based on relationships on the ground. And you need to allow them, uh, or you need to work on improving them. I, I've, I don't have a big answer for a, a, a centralised imposed model that would work. And I'm not sure that there is one. What we need to get these services working together is not, frankly, legislative action as such. It's improving services on the ground and improving communications on the ground and, frankly, improving the resources on the ground. It's not structural change that we need particularly. Willie, back to you. Hi, thanks very much for that. Really important contributions again there. Just my final question, Richard, if, in the interest of time. Um, the Auditor General's report was fairly critical of the government's ability to measure performance and quality of mental health outcomes and so on. But 
Everyone around the table has contributed some great ideas and great local experiences of good practice here, there and everywhere. So what are your views about how the government can better do this uh, so that we can report on outcomes? Because it's, it's really important. So should we collect this varied experience from around Scotland and, and somehow gather that together? I would really appreciate your views on how we should tackle this. Uh, start with you again, Dr Williams. So we, we used to, in Scotland, have a system uh, known as QOF, the Quality Outcomes Framework, uh, which was a way of um, um, GPs and, and their teams coding specific information in, in patient notes. Um, and, and it was a system of its time, and we, we um, abolished it in Scotland for, for, for good reason. It, it had become box ticking. It was causing burden. And at the time, we hoped that what uh, GP quality clusters would um, take over and uh, as, as Stephen was describing a sort of a bottom up uh, approach to teams and, and good practice would would uh, would um, develop um, new better ways of of, code, uh, of uh, not just coding activity because quaff we, we, we would um, capture a mental health review for example um, so we, we we dropped off recording the, um, mental health reviews in, in, in general practice for for some conditions um, and that doesn't mean that that activity is not happening it means we can't track it but as as you've mentioned actual clinical outcomes are probably the um, the, the, the preference that, that we would like and and um, sort of patient um, experience uh, as well um, but as yet and for, for the foreseeable future our, our workforce doesn't have the capacity um, as mentioned uh, in, in the term firefighting you know we are reacting to, to, to demand we are not yet in the space where we, we are able to be proactive I don't see us being reaching that space within the next couple of years to, to be to be frank um, I, I do think we'd need further modernization of, of primary care I do think general pr practices um, clinical systems are able to, to capture the sort of data on, on outcomes but our, our, our teams need the time to, to work together so that the the primary care mental health workers for example know how to use these clinical systems to their best so that the next generations of this this these clinical systems can come in and can be can be harnessed okay I mean, to, and so to Willie's point about um, how we capture outcomes, whether the kind of performance measurement systems are adequate or not, uh, I think, Pavan, you wanted to come in on this, so I'll bring you in next, and then after you, I'll turn to you, Christina. Thank you. Um, I, I quickly say I agree with both the points that Chris has made, which is in terms of systems and workforce capacity. They're two of the biggest issues in terms of having the appropriate and adequate IT system and infrastructure to support recording of information and data and having the workforce capacity. We don't want to be spending most of our time as clinicians recording data rather than seeing patients, but we need the systems to manage that. But another big challenge, I suppose, is about prioritization. Um, one of the most telling things for me in terms of the Audit uh, Scotland report is that in the section about improving services, the first thing it talks about is psychological therapy tar targets. Now, psychological therapies account for less than 10% of total mental health activity, mental health service activity. But there's this overwhelming focus on just that one single metric because it's easy to measure. Actually, what we don't know is how long someone might need to wait when they're in a crisis, how long they might need to wait if they need admission to a hospital bed, how many people have died while they're waiting for admission to hospital bed. We have no idea about any of those metrics. But there is this overwhelming focus on psychological therapy targets to the exclusion of all other clinical priorities. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that focusing on psychological therapy targets is not a good thing, but it's that skewing of priorities that is so dangerous. And I use the word dangerous not lightly because it does affect priorities. It does affect the focus. And that is the concern. So if we really want to understand what is happening in our services, we need a suite of measures. We need a very broad-based approach to measuring how services are performing, not focus on one thing and get stuck on that. Secondly, we need patient-reported outcomes. We need to hear from the people that we are serving how they're benefiting from them, and that is completely absent. We focus on activity and expect that to be a measure of everything being wonderful, and that is, again, a challenge. I think that's the second bit. The third bit is the government has done the work. I was involved in developing the work around the indicators almost six, seven years ago. 
there were a very broad suite of indicators that were developed and the report itself highlights that they still remain experimental, that there's been no investment in the infrastructure needed to measure that. And that is the challenge that I face as a clinician. Do I spend my time filling boxes, ticking boxes on a system or do I use that to see patients? And I know what I would much rather do. When patients really need care, I would much rather be seeing patients than spending lots of time on IT systems. And that is the challenge because the underlying administrative and IT infrastructure to record this information just doesn't exist. And that is then left to individual areas to you find different systems and they need to prioritize where they spend their money. Thanks, Pavan. In the interest of time, I'm going to ask Christina to make a very brief intervention at this point. Uh, so I'll bring you in and then I'm going to invite Sharon Dowie to put some final questions to you. Yeah, so I think as the report highlighted, Aberdeenshire Mental Health Improvement and Wellbeing Services, they use a tool for their community link worker um, service. But again, like all the, the colleagues have said, we're talking about complexity here. We need to have some minimum data sets that we use to, to capture the, the link worker information. But we also need to use a suite of tools, which I think that there was a team within the Scottish government that were looking at some evaluation and measurement tools. And, and I would like that work to be restarted and we will um, very much like to engage in that. Thank you and, and thanks for being so brief. Uh, Sharon, over to you for the, the, the remaining minutes that we've got left. Uh, to uh, get some more evidence on the record for us. Sharon. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a wee bit about recruitment and retention, and if I could get some reasons for the high vacancy and turnover rates on the mental health workforce. Um, also, a wee bit on the reliance of locum workers and the, the impact that this is having on service provision. So, Stephen, do you want to kick this one off? Uh, um, recruitment and retention. Uh, I, it's a matter of if you want to deal with the recruitment and retention crisis that you've got practically everywhere in this workforce, you need to pay staff more money and improve staffing levels. Now, I'm not saying that's the sole thing that needs done, but anybody that is suggesting that you're going to solve it without doing that really isn't saying anything serious at all. I mean, if you look at breathing space, which is, you know, a, a a good thing and, and widely applauded and all the rest of it, they're sitting with a 20% vacancy rate at the moment. Um, if you look at NHS 24's uh, uh, web page for recruitment, um, they're not trying to recruit, they, do, they don't have, they don't advertise vacancies for band six nurses, they advertise recruitment fairs for band six nurses. That's how that's how short staffed they are. Now, the the so the part of this is money. It's just straight money. Um, if you look at nurses in particular, historically, they they looked at themselves in terms of their pay should be similar to police officers and teachers, and they don't perceive that now. So that's that's part of the problem. The other thing is a lack of flexibility. Again, to look at NHS 24, that's the obvious one. I mean, it is essential and out of our service. However, the jobs they're advertising are talking about five, weeks out of, five weekends out of eight, six weekends out of eight, and eight weekends out of eight. And strangely enough, they're struggling to recruit. You know, so what you need is better staffing so that there's more flexibility, and that ties into locum workers and bank workers. Um, skilled staff are going there because they get to choose their own shifts, because there isn't enough flexibility in what the NHS is offering them. So, <coughs> fundamentally, you need to resource the system to allow, the flex to allow that level of flexibility and resource the system enough that it seems an attractive option to people. <coughs> There's more to it, but that's... Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to bring in um, again. We are quite tight for time, so I'm going to bring in Mike, who we've not heard from uh, for a while, just on this question of the vacancy turnover rates and just the the whole picture of staffing. Mike, we have a major issue here in in the sense that as a member of CCPS. You know, we're trying to establish a, a fair pay for fair work campaign across the third sector. We have a lot of 
very experienced, very skilled, very highly qualified people working in mental health services in the third sector. You know, but if you tell them they're only worth the minimum wage, then retaining them and recruiting them is always going to be difficult. Uh, and, and the campaign at the moment is, is to, to try and look at a minimum wage of around £13, uh, just £1 above the now agreed national minimum wage uh, by the Minimum Wage Foundation. So, so I mean, it's, it's, it's no rocket science. You know, we have to invest in the services that we want to deliver and we have to invest in the services that will deliver better outcomes for the people that we want to support or need to support. Thanks. I've got um, uh, Pavan and, and Christina want to come in on this point, then Sharon's got another question to put. Pavan. Thank you. Um, it, it is hugely complex, and what I would also want to offer is to share uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists report on recruitment and retention challenges with the committee, and I, I can send that um, subsequently. But there's several reasons from a medical workforce perspective that we think have contributed to this. So we've seen high rates of turnover, staff leaving, and that's to do with burnout. Um, we, I don't use the word crisis lightly. We feels like we're in a death spiral. So the more staff who leave, it creates place, places a greater burden on the staff who remain. And that has a huge impact on the burnout of that workforce. Um, so that's one challenge. But there's also a very specific question about locums. And the reason I highlighted that the current vacancy rate is 30% is because the official figures only measure the vacant posts, that is posts that we haven't been able to recruit usually for months, if not years at a time. 20% of our consultant workforce is currently made up of locums. And there are real challenges with having locums. But not least that a large proportion of the locums do not have the appropriate or necessary qualifications, a CCT, which is what is required to be a specialist to be in that post. Secondly, consultants do a lot more than just see patients. We do that, but we provide training. We provide input into learning from mistakes and improving services, undertaking critical incident reviews. We undertake teaching. We undertake supervision of other staff within the team. And if you want to expand the range of professionals within the team, you need that supervisory capacity and the support for training and teaching. All of that goes away when we have a locum because locums don't undertake any of those functions. So what you then have is a critical loss to system capacity to improve, but also to change, which is what is needed. And that is partly what I mean by being in a death spiral because the numbers have become so low that it's become almost virtually impossible to provide a safe service, let alone a good quality service in large parts of the country. And that is an emergency that we really need to sit up and look at. Thanks, Pavan. Uh, uh, Christina, vacancy and uh, turnover rates. Yeah, so I think for our workforce, the good news is that we don't have a, a shortage of people that is wanting to do this work. The challenge that we have has to do with retention, and that has to do with um, the, the capacity. So, for example, uh, Public Health Scotland uh, published that we've got just a little under 6 million registered patients across um, uh, you know, GP practices in Scotland. Now, the way we equate that, you know, it sh there should be at least one link worker per 10,000. So that should be about 591. At the moment, we've just got about 300. So we're, we're, we're not able to uh, uh, meet the, the, the demand because this work is about giving people time. Now, the other thing is a lack of value. We, we are not feeling valued. I mean, we've just uh, had the announcement, uh, you know, that the Glasgow crisis, uh, the Walker crisis, is about to be re resolved. But then our members, they can't get a mortgage, you see. So it's all temporary contracts. Now, if you're, if you're seeing a vacancy for something that is not even stable, I mean, you, you don't want to apply, and, 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 and that, that's not very good. Now, I had a look at the uh, health and uh, social care staff in Scotland, Act 2019, that is, uh, you know, on the consultation about to be published April 2024. 
Can you imagine? We're not even listed there, you see. And so what am I doing on this panel, you see? So we need to be listed there because we are part of the health and social care workforce. This is about making people feel valued and making the profession um, attractive, as well as providing support. I mean, I've been speaking with NHS Education Scotland. They need to provide education packages for us, CPD for us, provide training uh, opportunities so that we make sure that it's truly a fairer Scotland for all. Right, thank you for that. And I know we're short on time, so Dr Pavan, if there is any further information you want to give in writing, that would be helpful. Um, the next question is if I can get comments on the effectiveness of the new mental health workforce roles, including any views on the recently published mental health and wellbeing workforce action plan. And also, if you've been through the workforce action plan, if it gives you a sense in how we're actually going to achieve it. Stephen. That's Stephen. And that's the thing. There are lots of good things that uh, uh, it's very much in favour of good things and against bad things. You know, the, the workforce plan is, you know, it reads very well. Pick one thing. We were very pleased that there's a, an attention on um, workforce planning. The question is, is the, will, will the means be provided to deliver it? That's the question. It's less about the specifics of the plan. It's about the determination to pursue it because Frankly, we see a lot. A grand statement is made, but is the effort going to go in? Are the effort and the resources going to go in to deliver it? That's the question. It's not a question about the plan as such. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else want to come in on the workforce action plan? Mm. Chris. Yes, and again, I mentioned before primary care reform. Uh, there is, um, you know, willingness uh, to. To, to change how we're set up, the, the primary care mental health workers, I think, are are a, a very useful addition to, um, uh, to 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 our to our services that our patients can use and and, and are are very accessible. Um, but I do wonder that our primary care improvement plans uh, that we have across Scotland don't have the you know the, the sufficient resource to you know to to really take advantage of that that primary care mental health worker. So so um, those people who are based in, in you know in primary care with the line management through primary care. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Uh, we've got uh, Pavan wants to come in on this uh, uh, workforce action plan, and then we're going to turn then to the final question. So, Pavan on the workforce action plan. Thank you. I'll, I'll try my best to be succinct. I, I completely agree with the points Stephen made. So, th the plan is not lacking in ambition. We support almost all the ambitions within it, but unfortunately, I think what it's lacking in is the detail about how those ambitions are likely to be achieved in the timeframes for that and more importantly, the investment that's required. To put it in context, it takes at a minimum 15 to 16 years to train a consultant psychiatrist. So if we want to address the 30% gap in the consultant workforce in 15 years time, we need to make those decisions now. And that goes back to that longer term strategic need and planning and investment and sticking with it for multiple cycles. And unfortunately, we are not seeing that in the workforce plan. We're not seeing that longer term need for investment and any commitments to that in the plan as it currently exists. Okay. Last question. Thank you, last question. And the mental health strategy, <clears throat> excuse me, 2017 to 2027, action 15 of the strategy was to increase the workforce to give access to dedicated mental health professionals to all a &Es, all GP practices, every police station custody suite into prisons over the next five years, increasing additional investment to 35 million for 800 additional mental health workers in those key settings. So I suppose maybe specifically for Derek and for Dr Chris, if I could ask um, what access you have to mental health. Uh, so I, I would say that the, the usage of those acts at CES 15, that those monies they, the, um, is, is, is opaque. Uh, uh, from a general practice perspective, we feel that there are um, m many areas where, where that resource has not made its way through. Um, ha having said that, uh, if, if, it's, if, if workers are, are now um, um, aligned with the, the police services, I would say that is that, that there's huge benefit from, from that. Uh, and I, I wouldn't want to see any 
um, any slowdown uh, in, in that side of things. But my fear would be that um, some of those monies ha have been subsumed into, uh, into some of the secondary care services or, or where, it, where it wasn't specifically intended to, to be targeted. Thank you. And I'll answer this as best as my corporate knowledge will allow me to do. Uh, we have had Action 15 funding. It's been and piloted in a, in a very a pocket. It's not widespread across all custody areas in Police Scotland, as far as I'm aware. Um, and my concern will be that it's a, probably just come back to the conversation today, it will be a moment in time funding. It won't be sustainable funding. I think um, the, the last word this morning, I think Christina is going to go to you uh, on this question. So um, I'm delighted to invite you to uh, make your final contribution. Thank you so much. So I think, you know, we need to have universal access to link workers. So that report, it did highlight that some GP practices do not have link workers. I wonder, Chris, would you not like more of us, you see? We are there to look after the patient's holistic well-being. So I don't I don't really buy where, you know, the, the 800 is about a variety of suite of workforce. I need the Scottish government, we need the Scottish government to commit to how many community link workers are they going to recruit and demonstrating that we truly want to demedicalize life issues in Scotland? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Well, uh, on that note, uh, can I thank all of our panelists this morning for the contribution that you've made? Thank you for the time that you've given up, uh, and it's two hours you won't get back, I'm afraid. But. Um, uh, I also appreciate the fact that you will have all prepared before coming along here to give your evidence. And so uh, can I thank you very much on behalf of the committee for the really uh, top quality uh, evidence that you have given us this morning, which uh, is, uh, is very illuminating, uh, informative and at times very moving. So uh, can I thank you all and... Uh, uh, just a, a reminder, as uh, Sharon alluded to, if you do want to make any written uh, submission, if there are areas that we haven't got to, maybe that um, uh, you would have liked to have commented on, then by all means uh, put anything down in writing and we'd be delighted to accept it. Uh, but with that, can I uh, uh, thank you again for your attendance and I'll now draw the public part of this morning's committee to a close. Thank you. <laughs>